Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to get started in just one more moment. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm still seeing our attendee numbers go up really quickly, which is so exciting, thank you. And so we're going to give it just one more moment before we kick off. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're gonna to start just one more moment as soon as I see the attendee number start to kind of even out. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know that you are all incredibly busy, and we are so appreciative that you've taken time out of your day to upskill with the Brown School of Professional Studies. My name is Allison Weiss, and I'm the Associate Director of Corporate and Executive Education at the Brown University School of Professional Studies. The mission and vision of the Brown School of Professional Studies is to empower you, our professional learners, with the skills networks, and tools that you need to transform the way the world works for good. And that is an inspiring mission, and it has never been needed more. And I have the numbers to prove it. According to recent employee engagement surveys, the way that the world works now does not work for the majority of people. According to a Gallup survey that was done just in November of last year, over 70% of US workers report being disengaged. And this is really alarming for a number of reasons. Disengaged workers are more likely to be less productive and less creative and less innovative. But in addition, because many of us spend over 50% of our, working, our waking lives at work, that also leads to really low levels of mental and emotional health. And so that is something that we really want to change because of both the outcomes and also because of the people. We want the way the world works to work for everybody. In addition, 44% of global and 52% of US employees reported that they experienced a lot of stress in the previous day alone. And lastly, this quote is very striking. It says, employee stress has been rising for over a decade. Gallup finds that managers play an outsized role in the stress workers feel on the job, which influences their daily stress overall. And I know that that quote can initially sound yeah. a little daunting, but I actually find it really inspiring because that means that each of you who've shown up today to learn a different way to approach change management, you each have an outsized influence on the people that you manage either directly or indirectly. And that means that you have the ability to radically transform the way your work works for good and therefore as a cascade effect, we can change the way the world works for good. So thank you for being here and thank you for stepping up. And I hope that you see Brown's School of Professional Studies as your lifelong partner in getting the skills that you need to advance in your own career and help other people thrive in theirs. We offer a portfolio of programs on in-demand topics offered in flexible formats across our professional and early career masters, which we have about 33 of, we also offer over 30 non-credit programs, which include short courses, certificate programs, and free masterclasses like this one you're at today. And in addition, we can work with you and your company directly to customize any experience and either bring it to you or invite you onto campus and have you come to us. All of our programs are research-backed, which is one of the unique aspects of Brown's portfolio programs. And we cluster our programs in three areas leadership, data and technology, and healthcare. And in particular, I want to call your attention to a couple of programs that are actively recruiting now that you might be interested in. Because you showed up today, I am going to make the assumption that you are probably most interested in our leadership portfolio. And I'd love to invite you to consider attending a couple of our courses. First, we have our Applied Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Strategies Certificate, 
which starts next week. And so our registration is open for the remainder of this week and the beginning of next week. It is a six week course that gets rave reviews and is highly, highly applied. Secondly, we are offering our Leader as Coach program as a three-day in-person experience on the Brown campus, October 16th through 18th, and we would love to have you there. And lastly, we have an incredible program called the Executive Program in General Management, and our very own Ed Barrows is the primary instructor <laughs> and also the primary developer for this course. And so some of the content that you see here today is actually going to be included in that program. It is a three course certificate that helps you develop your individual level skills, your ability to lead teams and organizations, and your ability to lead into the future. And it's a really exciting course that we would love to have you be involved in. And you have the opportunity to influence the future of our portfolio. At the end of today's session, I'm going to send out a poll to all of you and ask you to help us choose what topics we should do future programs on. My last piece of housekeeping before I introduce and turn things over to Ed is that if you have a question, please don't hesitate to ask it. I will be monitoring the Q&A throughout today's session and I'd love to take your questions at any time. Please click on the bottom bar of Zoom, click on Q&A and type and submit your questions there. And that will help us get to as many of your questions as possible when we get to the Q&A section. Oh, and this is a little bit more information about our executive program for general managers. It is a three course certificate that starts on October 22nd. We would love for you to join us. So with that, I'm really pleased to introduce and turn things over to Ed Barrows. Ed is our professor of the practice and leadership at Brown University, and he has worked with level leaders at all levels in the areas of strategy, strategic leadership, and leader development for the past 25 years. He is an international certified coach, uh, certified, sorry, coaching federation certified coach. I know I got myself tongue tied there. Okay. And a member of Harvard's Institute of Coaching. Prior to joining Brown, Ed worked as managing director at Duke Corporate Education, where he was responsible for designing and delivering programs for portfolio of global clients. And prior to that, he worked with professional services organizations, including Deloitte, General Electric, PwC, and the Palladium Group. I think what always stands out to me when I get to hear Ed teach, and I'm very lucky I get to hear him teach quite a bit, <laughs> is that he has such a great, unique blend of having had the experience of being in the work like all of you are. And so knowing what really matters when you're trying to put the skills into practice. And he is also just an absolutely incredible teacher. He is also the author of the 12 Skills book, the co-author along with Laura Downing. And this is the book that all of these programs are based on. So with that, I will welcome and turn things over to you, Ed. Thank you for being with us today. Oh, wow. Thanks very much, Allison. I appreciate it. Um, let me go ahead and pop my slides on the screen. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you're calling in from. It's nice to see you. We're going to spend a few minutes today talking about uh, what might seem like a pretty mundane topic and an old one, um, change leadership. We're going to add a little revamping to it, but I'll explain why, and I think you'll see with a bit of data why it's as relevant today as it's ever been. In fact, maybe more so. So if, you, if you're new to the webinars that we have on lessons in leadership, uh, this was really for you. We're going to give you a quick welcome and an overview on what lessons in leadership is all about and core skills in particular. We'll talk about the 12 skills that Allison mentioned in, in the book that my colleague Laura Downing and I put together. And then we'll spend the bulk of our time together really delving into change leadership. And, and the goal for us or for me and, and uh, us here at Brown is to really give you sort of the distilled version of what you need in your role. And presumably most of you are not full-time change managers, but a, a leader who's participating in change in some capacity. So let's talk about that. So we have a burgeoning, uh, ever-growing, as Allison pointed out, portfolio of things you can take advantage of here in the School of Professional Studies. I encourage you to come to our web website. And as it says here from these screenshots, join the conversation. We've got all kinds of articles um, things you can jump into, webinars like this, but um, Lessons in Leadership is really to bring some of our knowledge, not just from um, my perspective, but from across the university and the School of Professional Studies to you. So there's a lot of things, you know, check back regularly. There's topics on healthcare, um, just sustainability. Please take a look. You'll find things that should be interesting regardless of what you do. Uh, a few years ago, my colleague, Laura Downing, and I, and if you've been here before, you've heard this uh, 
took a look at what are the things uh, organizations and leaders in particular need to master to advance in their careers. And we found that there's 12 of these of these skills and their skills, meaning you can develop these. Um, the one that's highlighted is what we're going to talk about here today. The other ones we've already covered and they're available um, on replay. But we're going to talk about change management and le change leadership in particular. But the 12 skills model looks like this. There's six areas, strategy and results, talent and teams, communication and change. And within them, there's um, there's the individual skills and pairs. There's these areas and there's the 12 skills. If you go to the 12 skills website, you can download workbooks that we have for free. Um, there's self-assessments and all kinds of stuff that you can use if you're interested in taking it a little bit further. Or I'd encourage you to use some of the tools with your teams. Uh, that might be helpful, especially if you're doing change. So the question for today that we're going to wrestle with is why change leadership? I mean, why don't we just call it change management? Why do we even have the topic? Well, you've seen this, if you've been here before, this backdrop. Markets are changing. There's a lot of volatility in markets. There's greater uncertainty and ambiguity than ever before. Um, there's massive shifts in technology, especially around AI. And there's a lot of questions around how is that going to impact the workforce? You see a lot of research coming out. And it's early, but it's starting to take hold in terms of what is what is the adoption of technology, AI in particular, mean for leaders? We here at Brown are starting to focus on really the human AI connection and any of the topics that are related to human capacity and how they relate to AI, such as leadership, such as training middle managers, such as making decisions. We're starting to explore and bring that to the audiences and the students that we work with. The workforce is changing. Structurally, it's changing. Leaders have to help employees at all levels manage and navigate change. Individuals themselves are different. You've got a wider generation distribution in the workforce, people bringing new skills into the workforce, uh, people working longer, people working remotely. There's all kinds of changes that are happening that are impacting individuals, their tastes and preferences too. And we need to be cognizant of that and how to manage that um, within the organizations that we work in. And the last piece is that the organizations themselves are transforming. Organizations are not only being disruptive, but they're doing work differently. You know, mergers and acquisitions are constantly occurring. Um, and that requires a lot of change. Now, what you see on the right-hand side, is I always like to take a snap shot of some popular books. These are not endorsements by any means, but they're just things that you've probably come across. John Cotter, who was at Harvard Business School and then started Cotter International, his own firm, really kind of one of the thought leaders in the field, has a, a variety of articles and books on the topic. Um, William Bridges put together a model we're going to use. Some, he may not be as popular, but I think he's got one of the more useful ways to think about change. It really speaks to this idea of leading change. Adaptive leadership, which is a leadership theory developed by, um, you see, Ron Heifetz, and uh, Marty Linsky, and they have another co-author there, it, it is practiced here. We teach it at Brown and is, is particularly useful in environments like healthcare where adaptive change is, is occurring and the leaders have to work their teams through that change. And then HBR has a number of best top reads on change management you'll find in their compendium. So all of these are, they're useful guides. Again, not endorsing any of them, but the idea is there's, these are some of the things that you're most likely to see if you've worked in the area of change for any point in time. But this, this um, discussion today in the topic in the 12 skills book isn't necessarily for people who lead change as a discipline, it, although they could use this, but really for managers and leaders who lead change or involved in it as part of their day-to-day -day work. So, so why is this included in the 12 skills when we did our secondary research on it? Well, um, change used to be, there was a theory created back in, or I should say identified back in the early 90s called punctuated equilibrium and uh, posited that um, organizations and industries worked in relative, I don't say tranquility, but consistency and predictability for periods of time. And then they would go through this punctuation that would cause change. Um, that model is still around, but what we see is change isn't so episodic as it is more constant these days. It happens more frequently. And you'll see why here in a couple of slides, why that's important. And the pace of change is accelerating too. So when you look at the adoption rates of technology, you think of something like AI and its its impact on organizations and the work that we do, it's happening faster and faster than ever before. As the saying goes, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. Um, and employees need leaders who can help them cope with change in all the different forms and fashions, you know, coming out of the pandemic, hybrid work, you know, the nature of the workforce is changing, the work itself is changing. Uh, and that creates a lot of uncertainty and we need leaders who are skilled at guiding people capably through through the change that we see in organizations. So 
what does that look like for us? Well, this is this chart's a little bit dated. I think it's one of the newer ones. And what you see here, and you can just find this if you just search in Google, technology adoption rates. What we see when we look at technology adoption rates from the early part of the 20th century up until the 21st century is, if you look at this graph on a little more granular level, what you'll see is the slope's a bit steeper for the adoption rates and it happens considerably faster when you go from vacuum, refrigerator, electricity, all the way up to you know podcasting and e-books. E um, but what we see is the rate with which technology is adopted and proliferated is accelerating. Uh, and that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who's been around. You remember the year of the BlackBerry, the iPhone, the iPod, things that, you know, the Palm Pilot, things that we don't even use anymore or, or be in the Smithsonian. But the idea here is that we're seeing faster and faster adoption rates, which means we have to be more skilled and capable of driving change. This snapshot I just took from... Um, some Accenture work that they put out. Um, and this is a survey that was done in 2023 about what was going to happen in 2024 CEO Pulse that said, you know, what what are the biggest concerns that the C-suite leaders have when it comes to um, change in 2024? And the idea in the sense is that leaders believe that there's a higher level of change that's happening today to previous eras and that over half of organizations aren't really prepared to adapt to this kind of change. A lot of that change comes from technology. And you see 88% of um, C-suite leaders polled expect an even faster rate of change and that will continue, we would assume, into the future to some degree. So, so there is a pressing need for leaders at all levels to really understand the tenets of effective change. So what we want to do for the balance of our discussion today is really get you and your team prepared for change? How do we think about that? What can we do? How can we contextualize what change looks like and then get ourselves ready for it? We want to think about how do we implement change initiatives more effectively? You, probably most of you have them happening in your organization already. How do, we, how do we make sure that we execute those to the fullest extent possible? And then how do we keep people and, and employees that, that work with us on our teams focused on the change and keep it going, sustain the change, right? As we say sometimes in the discipline, we don't let them backslide. So I'm going to ask you, as is customarily the case, to rate your own change leadership skills. And there's three variables that we have in the model. You'll see it here momentarily. But just give yourself, and please put it in the chat. I assume you can, you can add those numbers up, zero to three, um, the skill that you have in taking time to communicate changes, you know, carefully executing them and monitoring progress, and then institutionalizing those. For the changes that you've been involved in, how would you rate yourself as sort of a change leader? Let's see what people have to say. Seven. Thanks, Ali. Appreciate that. It's pretty good. A seven-ish, Jabari. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not, I'm not in, in Boston tomorrow, Jabari. Hey, Brian. Thanks. Uh, six, six. Uh, seven, Carrie. So you've got a bunch of people six is i guess an eight great thanks yeah so five okay if you're there that's fine looks like six seems to be the central tendency some sevens good so um if you're a five or a four or a seven it's eight whatever the case is you know this will be a recap but you might pick up a few bits and a couple of tools to contextualize it we're not going to give you a change plan uh, you can create that on your own. But what we are going to give you is a framework and a way to think about change. It should be pretty straightforward. Now, I'll give you, a, again, as customarily as the case, Rebecca, six plus, very good, or plus or minus. Um, think about somebody that you've worked with. Um, ideally, it would be somebody that you worked for or some type of leader that you've worked around. And if, you know, that you would characterize as being good at, you know, someone who's really good at change leadership that can manage projects, get things done, especially if they're organizational types of changes, implementing a technology, you know, bring carving out a part of the business, you know, think about if you work with them and, and just put in the chat, you know, one thing that pops into your mind, what did they do as a change leader or someone that happened to be working on driving change that was so effective? So just you know, one or two words. You don't have to put everything you can think of. But well, what what would you say made that person really skilled? Uh, listening, um, understanding, and meeting folks wherever they are. Communication. You'll see uh, that's already popped up, you know, several times. Active engagement, alignment. That's a big one. CK, thank you. Um, making sure that people are aligned around what it is we're trying to accomplish. What does that mean? Being real. That's an interesting. Presumably not candy coating the reasons behind the change. Uh, take action on the things that they're hearing. Set, have a vision for the change. That can be really helpful. It goes back to 
Cotter's eight steps of change. Transparency, yeah, enthusiastic and being positive about it and understand some of the, the politics or the networks that influence that. Clear goals, all these are really good. Um, and any of those pieces of literature that we covered earlier should hit on those. But I want to give you kind of the bare bones piece. But you can so you can see good at communicating, um, good at aligning people. You know, communicating also includes you know listening. You know, having a point of view or a vision where you're going and goals that are associated with that. Managing that process and and keeping people um, ultimately uh, engaged with everything that they're doing. Now. The simple, straightforward three-step process that Laura and I created is essentially, and, and if you go back to Kurt, I think it's the Lewin model, um, which was uh, unfreeze, change, and refreeze. It's not, it, it is a little bit different than that, but it's it's got the three steps in here. But the idea is you want to help get your organization prepared for the change. You want to communicate that change is coming, what it means. I think that gets back to that getting real point that was made. Um, why we need to do this, and uh, sometimes we call that the case for change, and ultimately the benefits that will um, come from the change. In addition to sort of setting up, and of course you'd have project management work that would go alongside of this. This is the leadership side. You need to help people transition through the change. You execute the plan, you monitor progress, you diagnose if there's any issues that you see happening on the organization and you respond to any challenges or obstacles. And then you have to sustain it with some type of institutionalization of the change. And oftentimes that comes through uh, some routines that people have. Now, what do we think about change leadership? Why the distinction? Well, I would say probably everybody on this call has heard about change management. That shouldn't be a surprise. It's been around since we started implementing you know, technology systems in the 80s and 90s. And, and that was really to, to manage all of the work that went along with it. And there's a people aspect of that too. I don't want to decouple them artificially. But when we think about change leadership, that's something that the expectation is you can do in your role. And it really has more to do with helping people break free of the mental models, the ways of working, the way they think, the way they behave, and really accepting what it is they're going to do differently. It, it's it's almost, I don't want to call it the softer side of change, but it has to do more with the workforce than it does with the mechanics of the technology or the organizational structure itself. Not to say that those aren't important. I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm just suggesting that in our capacity as leaders in part of 12 skills, we're attending to the people side a little bit more. So change management is really around the, I would say, the project management side, or as it says here on the side, the operational side of change. It's all the project steps that you need to get done, get the milestones done on time, on budget, things like that. That's critical. You need great project management to do that. Paired with that is change leadership. So that's really this human side that enables the mechanics of change that are occurring on the operational side to happen smoothly. So they 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 operate hand in glove, hand in hand, right? So it's it's the communication that goes along with the project plan. It's the managing of obstacles or barriers when they pop up. It's helping people be you know, work through the difficulties that they have or the emotional issues that they have. It's being a cheerleader at the right time. And you'll see a framework that we have here that will help with that. But remember, it's really keeping the momentum going for the team, which is essential when it comes to managing change. Now, a um, couple of other things to think about. Um, what are some of the tenets of change? So when you're driving change, what do you need to keep in mind as a leader. So this goes back to the point about vision. I think it's somewhat similar. It's not entirely the same, but we have to help people understand where they're going. What is the purpose of the change that they're aiming at? We also need to set clear expectations for performance. What are the things that we want to change behaviorally that we want to have people do differently? What are some of the things that we want to maybe break from? Uh, there's a phrase that I like to use, roots and change. You know, what are the roots that give us energy that we want to hold on to, say, from our culture? You know, how do we make sure that we sustain those as leaders? But if there's also chains that are holding us back, how do we break free of those? A good leader will be able to diagnose on his or her team what the issues are and how to work around those. And also there's an element of self-care. You know, change can be really enervating. It could take a lot out of people. How do we give people the time and the energy space to, to recalibrate and re, sort of refocus? Um, we want to make sure if there's data and information, and we saw this in the chat when people put in what skills were essential for change, transparency. <clears throat> how do we make sure people have 
<clears throat> excuse me, transparency in terms of what we're doing, data and information to help guide the change. People need tools to do their work, right? So if there's additional training that needs to be done, and there's obviously training around technology and applications and things like that. But if people have to do work differently or reskill in some cases, we need to give them the, the tools to do so. And that relates also to, <clears throat> excuse me, development and upskilling. We have to make sure that people have the skills. <clears throat> Sorry, let me, uh, let me clear my throat here momentarily. All right, I think we're back. Sorry about that. Um, we have to give people the ability to invest and develop the skills that go along with doing things differently, not just from the technology side or from the org structure side, but from the skill side. Um, we want people to have some level of autonomy in the change. I mean, obviously within some boundaries or guide rails or guardrails rather, but we want people to feel like they own an aspect of the change. There's, there's a phrase that we can keep in mind what I think is pretty important is if you want people to buy into a change, then make sure they have a role or a stake in it as opposed to being changed. So co-opt people into the process of change, find ways where they can contribute, <clears throat> and then make sure that you, you give them the ability to be successful. And then make sure you're listening and acting on suggestions and feedback that people have. And we talked about that earlier in the chat that we want to hear people's feedback. We want to listen and be effective in that capacity as leaders. So these are some of the things that we want to keep in mind. Have a sense of purpose, set out expectations, make sure there's clear performance data, give people the tools that they need and make the investment. Don't expect people to change without giving them the skills to do so. Autonomy where it's appropriate and also, you know, listen, you know, get their feedback and keep them engaged. So one of the things that I think could be really important and I've used in a prior job is this idea of the why, right? It, many of you have probably seen Simon Sinek's Golden Circle Start With Why his book. If you haven't, you know, just Google it. It'll come up. It's been out there for a long time. It's very good. You know, and, and oftentimes, I would say almost every time we're going to make any type of change, you know, we, have, we work in an environment where people are smart. Uh, they're largely knowledge-based workers in the, in the organizations we work and live in. Um, they want to know why we're doing something. Why are we changing it? And we hear the old um, adage, oh, we've always done it this way. Uh, why do we need to change? So managers and leaders right from the top have an obligation to explain. And I would say if they want the change to go well, and this really is the leadership side, speak to why. And one of the things I like to call or colleagues and I call it is build the case for change. Like it's, it's not quantitative necessarily, although it can be, but you're trying to get people to understand why the change is happening. And then another important question is not just why, but why now? So why do we have to do this? And why do we have to do this right now? What's important about doing it now? It's helpful when you craft a case for change to help people understand what are the implications of not doing this? If we don't go through with this change, what are some of the challenges that we'll see within our organization, within our industry? How will it impact our ability to compete effectively? People will want to know the benefit. They will want to know what are the things that we are going to get from this. And of course, if you're very skilled as a leader, you want to know what you, you want to know and help people understand what's the benefit for me, right? What's in it for me? It's one of the most common questions that sometimes leaders forget to or overlook in a change process is what is the benefit for me? You're asking me, Mr. or Miss Leader, to go through this change. What am I going to get out of it? Um, and that you can link that in some respects back to the concept of transformational leadership. But the idea here is I'm going to be different presumably better as a function of going through this change, but leaders need to make the case and clarify what that's going to look like for people because ultimately change is individual, right? I mean, I'm concerned if I'm going through an organizational change with how it's going to impact me, my job, my work, my future. So leaders have a, a really responsibility to clarify that for people. Um, and then they're also going to want to know, hey, do we have to do this? Are there other alternatives? Why is this what we're going to do as an organization, the best option? Now, one of the challenges with these questions, as simple as they are, is that sometimes leaders, uh, more senior leaders, may have the propensity to go through these kinds of changes without asking and answering these questions up front. And that can get a little challenging when it comes time to roll out the change because employees are smart. 
uh, they will want to know, okay, why are we doing this and all these questions. So leaders, you want to make sure you have these down in advance. Now you might be saying, well, I'm not at the level in an organization where I get to ask these questions and make these decisions. That's fair. However, you should ask your supervisor, your boss, two levels up if you do skip levels and the like, um, come up with what you think the answers to these are and encourage them to have those answers too, right? Because whether if we don't answer them, it doesn't make the questions go away. It's just going to make it more difficult when employees start asking and leaders ought to have the answers to these. So what does this case for change look like? I pulled one out that I found. It's just a basic structure. And this is not new and it's not sophisticated, but it can be very, very useful. It's just as a rural electric organization. There's no magic to this. So what you want to do when you build a case for change, and, and there's different ways to do it, but this one I found uh, is actually pretty handy, is you just... You, you do a from to, or an as is to the to be. This is not a new tool by any stretch of the imagination. And typically what you put down the center is a set of variables around inside or outside the organization. What do you want to have change? What are the things that are gonna change? And here you see power source, environmental issues, the distribution network, technology customers. There's no magic to that, but you just think through the different aspects of the organization that may change. Could be finances, could be your customer relationship, could be, again, you have the technology platform that you use, et cetera. So these are, these are not generic, they're specific to the organization and the industry. And then what you do in the case for change is you list all the things that are on, in this case, the, the left-hand side, if you're looking at the screen, and how they are going to be different in the future. So in power source, you see on the left, carbon fuels, principally coal fuels. This organization is moving to renewables, solar, wind, and hydropower. On the environmental issues, their position and posture has been generally reactive, but they're trying to change the organization to make it more proactive, to be more anticipatory. When they think about the distribution network, they're going to, from a, a sort of a push the power to customers to uh, you know getting on the smart grid and doing doing cogeneration. And we can go through all these from mechanical, analog, electrical to digital and the technology side. So what does this do for us? You know why bother going through this activity? When I've done this, it's an incredibly valuable way to socialize change and help people see and actually participate in. And give me a minute to explain. Um, the thinking around the case for change. So oftentimes that leaders or senior leaders or a change team will build this, but the process of socializing and sharing it with groups helps them understand and start to put their fingerprint on it. So they might not say, they might say something like, well, look at technology. Um, it's mechanical, analog, electrical. It's electronic, digital, and something else. You know, we need to also think about the future incorporating um, new emerging types of technologies, you know, we would say AI today, right? So, so when you present this and give employees a, dis, a discussion forum to think about this, almost like chew on it, what it does is it helps them start to break apart the, the larger change that's happening in an organization, say implementing a new piece of technology or carving out or setting up a different organization and look at it in terms of the impact on more individualized variables. And then people can start to select and understand, okay, I primarily primarily work in, with customers. So I can start to think about how is this going to impact my customers? How is it going to change the relationship that I have with customers? What's going to be different about how we do business in the future relative to how we do it today? So as you go through these, you can, you can start to see and really put into context some important distinctions between what's happening today and what's happening in the future. And what this does for us is it gets us to think about that case for change in a more tangible ter terms. And that's important. So people can see it and understand it and they can start to, and leaders can start to build that vision of the future um, that says, what is the world going to look like uh, when we are there? Um, what is the environment going to look like environmentally when we get there? Obviously, it's environmentally. What is the technology platform we're going to use look like and why is it going to benefit us when we get there? So it can start answering the kinds of questions that are teed up on the last slide in a context that, again, makes it a little more discreet 
for employees who are, are sort of getting exposed to the change. So we don't want to just say, hey, we're, we're going to be going through some type of organizational change and new technology, new division, et cetera. We really want to give people the ability to think about not only what's going to change at a more detailed level, but have some opportunity to think about how it's going to impact them. Now, related to that, and I mentioned this um, earlier, this idea of the bridges model. Um, so I don't know if you have heard, some of you probably have about William Bridges, that book's been around for quite a while. And this transitions model is really what's the sort of core element of it. And one of the things that I think is really important to think about as change leaders is this view, is that when you go through a change in an organization and it, and it takes it away from what I would call the mechanistic side or the project management operational side into that human side is, is people oftentimes experience a feeling of loss, of an emotional loss with something. Um, if anyone has ever lost a job here, please do not put your hand up or respond in the chat. I'm not asking you to. But if anyone's had some something that's happened in the workplace, whether they lost their job or they were put into a different job or moved, there's a real emotional loss that occurs. There's a sense of an ending. The job that I had, the team that I was on, the people that I worked with and liked, I'm not part of that anymore. I'm not on that team anymore. And that is an emotional response for most people. Um, and they go through these sort of stages of grief or transition that um, you see here. These are not the stages of grief per se. These are the transition model. But, but people have to wrestle with the ending of something that they are not going to be doing anymore. It's the old way of doing things. And maybe it's just how they performed a particular activity on their job. But what our job is as leaders is to help them come to terms with the loss that occurs in the ending, move them through this neutral and this liminal space into the new beginning where that's often where they'll be building the new skills, working in a new way, interacting with new colleagues. It's a new beginning for them. So why go through this? And some of you might be saying, well, this is pretty self-evident, Ed. There's not a lot to this. Something ends, we go through this transition and there's something new. But what's important about it is it helps us as leaders get in touch with people's emotions and give us a context for not only having a discussion and sort of pulling out some of the feelings that people are experiencing and some of the frustrations, as well as highlighting some of the opportunities. It gives us something to follow as we move people through the change process. And it's important. Because again, going through a project plan while important to getting the work done, doesn't necessarily attend to the emotional side of change. So wherever you are as a leader, whatever you're doing, it doesn't have to be a large major organizational initiative. You're doing something novel or different on your team. You know, keep in mind that people oftentimes experience this transition. They, they, they sense that something is not in, in place anymore, that they're going to have to go through this area of kind of ambiguity or the neutral zone into this area of new beginnings. And our job as leaders is to guide them through that in an effective way. So again, I would highly encourage you to keep this in mind as part of your work as a manager or a leader, because you will invariably go through some type of organizational change. And if you have a team we really have a responsibility to help people manage through that through that effectively. Um, so sometimes there's barriers or there's resistance to change, right? So in order to, and this gets at um, some work um, from Harvard that talks about, you know, what is it that causes people not to change? Uh, oftentimes there's some big assumption that people have that isn't out on the table. And again, remember, Change is often very personal, right? So we want to we want to look at change and ask people and think about like, are people holding on to some type of assumption that you need to figure out to help them get through the change process? Like an assumption is, uh, I won't be able to learn the new skills in the job, or there's an assumption that you know this may impact me and my family unfavorable over the unfavorably over the long term. It has to do with the benefits that I might lose. But the idea is that people have oftentimes some type of anchor or assumption that's holding them back and leaders need to understand that. So you can ask questions around like, what's gonna, you know, if you could change something at work to make it more effective, what would it be like? 
Um, you know, what if you if you imagine doing the opposite of what might be holding you back or making you feel uncomfortable or scared, what would that look like? You know, what's worrisome um, or preventing you from engaging in some new behavior? You know, what are the things that you're committed to, you're holding on to? And then this concept of competing commitments is also a very important one. People sometimes have a competing commitment that they're not even aware of. So if you've ever tried to change yourself as an individual, like if you've ever tried to get fit or something like that, but not been able to do it, oftentimes there's what's called a competing, competing commitment that's holding you back. And you have to ask yourself, is there something, is there some reason? Is it, is that I don't want to spend the money on the new app? Or is it, I really just like eating a certain type of food, or I really like watching TV at night and I don't want to exercise or whatever the case is. Oftentimes there's something else that whether you articulate it or not, it's, it's so important um, it's important to the degree that it keeps you from going through the change. And that's not just true of our individual lives. It's a true of our organizational lives as well. So these questions can start to unearth these big assumptions that, that exist in people's minds and help us as leaders, again, manage that transition through um, this, this away from the ending through the neutral zone into the, the new environment. But, but be, you know, resistance to change is a, is a major issue in organizations, but there's ways to diagnose it. And this is one of the tools that we can use. Um, so when it comes to driving change, there's a, there's a handful of practices. You should certainly have a plan. Um, you certainly want to make sure you have a plan to guide people through the steps. It's not all leadership, there's some mechanics, but you need people on board. You have to get buy-in and that's why we show you the case for change and help you attend to the emotional side because if you can't get that, it's gonna be very hard to get people to move through the process. Communication came up, I would say more than anything else when we did our little poll at the beginning, but you've gotta be consistent with messaging. Um, you, you know, the, the mantra that I learned early in my career as a consultant that worked doing change is um, you can't over communicate during a change. Obviously, you want to communicate using accurate information, but where there is an absence of information, I promise you, because I've lived this, people will fill in the white space with information that is usually not accurate. So as a leader, you want to be consistently giving messages and clarity around why we're doing this, what's happening, where are we in the process? That enables people to understand clearly, again, where they are and where they're going. You've got to provide the resources and structures that people need. And you also, you know, you'll hear this in the Cotter work talks about this quite a bit. The idea is that you want to celebrate milestones, um, you, know, you know, whether they're small wins or quick wins or big wins. And I have to be honest with you, managers are oftentimes very poor at this. Uh, taking time out to say, hey, team, we did a great job. It doesn't have to be a gala celebration, but the idea is that you get people to, to recognize that they've done something well. And it, there's nothing wrong with pointing out to your team, hey, you know, Susan did a fantastic job. I thought you were amazing. Or, you know, Tom, you know, he was initially not on board, but I mean, he's become such an amazing champion. I just want to highlight, you know, his great work here. That's the kind of stuff leaders tend not to do uh, enough of. And my experience has been that people generally really appreciate that. I'm sure some of you can attest to that too. Now, um, when you're transitioning again, try to keep your change plans straightforward. Don't do too much, make it clear, concise, so that people can understand it. Make sure again, back to my point about, you know, people accept change when they're involved in it, get the effective people involved. Don't build a plan and then roll it out to people who have never seen it before. You know, let them have some type of imprint on the plan. Break it down into milestones and chunks like any plot project plan. Have clear roles and responsibilities, but also be flexible. You know, as we used to say in the military, I'm sure they still say it, you know, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. The idea is as soon as you start executing your plan, you are going to run into challenges that will make it so that you will have to make adaptations. Plan for it. Expect it. Just build in some flexibility. All these considerations need to be brought into not only your change management plan, but your change leadership plan, too. So if you want to sustain change, you know, this is sort of a, a bit of a Sisyphean view here. You have to be persistent. Okay. This is, you will have to, as this, as this very strong woman is doing here, you are going to have to pull the weight up the hill to avoid backsliding. Oftentimes people will want to go back into older behaviors. Your job as the leader is to push them through the training, make sure they incorporate it. I, I lived this in my last job, watching people transition into a, a performance tracking system. And it was, 
people really didn't want to do it. It required an awful lot of push to get them on this new uh, this new platform. Uh, but it was a it, it required much. I remember watching the person who was responsible for the change. It required much more um, training and investment of time and pushing than the person and the team had considered. So it's really worth thinking about how to be persistent up front. Um, you know, you manage the climate as there are going to be setbacks and there are going to be challenges and there's going to be obstacles. You want to try to be positive. You want to maintain that positive momentum. And that's hard. Um, you know, people are excited. You've seen that project curve where it starts up at the top and people are excited and then it sort of dips down as people get you know tired and then it comes back when they're about to wrap up. But your job as a leader and your team is to keep people um, motivated and moving forward. You want to model the behavior. You know, I'll hear this oftentimes when I'm doing my classes and teaching here at Brown uh, on the leadership side. One of the things people will bring up is I think when they ask what their definition of leadership is, they'll say uh, it's setting the example. There's a real power to a setting the example, certainly coming out of the military, I was keeping that. Uh, but that's not just a military thing, it's everybody. If you want to demonstrate how to do things differently, it's great to model that behavior. If your change gets stuck, it starts foundering, you have to resuscitate it. Um, you are going to have to do something that requires active engagement and pushing the change forward. But don't give up. Stay the course. Uh, you know, senior leaders and why this is part of the 12 skills um, suite of skills is because senior leaders in organizations need managers at all levels to be able to drive change. Um, not everyone can do it. It's an important skill and it's more important today than ever before, as we saw um, from some of the research at, from Accenture. So just to kind of bring this home and wrap things up and pass it over to Allison so we have some time to take some questions. You know, if you're the change leader and you want to be a great change leader, set the example, model the behavior that you want to have, you know, be positive, you know, be enthusiastic, you know, be an early adopter, do the kinds of things that are going to let people know that, hey, you're out ahead of the pack, not being dragged up the stairs, as was the case on our last graphic, okay, but you want to be a person that's not only a cheerleader and an advocate, but you want to be out, out front, and there's all kinds of opportunities in your organization, um, to get involved in change and to be part of projects and to be someone that can put your own sort of stamp on the work that's being done. So don't be afraid to build your skills and jump into a project that's got some, some sort of heft to it to really help bolster your skills in your career. And then commit to that change. You know, if it's going to happen in the organization, you can either be sort of pushing the wave forward or having that tidal wave crash down on you. You know, I would argue that the former is better than the latter. So, you know, be somebody that really champions the new way of doing things and bring people along because, because we need more change leaders in organizations than ever before. So these are the kinds of things that hopefully distill down in the chapter, give you the kinds of things that you need to be affected without going through all the gory detail. Again, take a look at those books if you have time, if you have to really jump into a change. But for the rank and file manager who's just bolstering his or her skills, this should be very useful to you. So what we have coming up here in the next few months, we're going to finish up the 12 skills um, right at the end of the year. So we've done one a month since January, and they're available, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you can find them on YouTube. Allison can tell you about that stuff. But we've got, you'll enjoy influence and persuasion. Um, I designed it. My colleague, Laura, we both taught influence and persuasion in a former life in graduate school. And I think you'll find is really, really interesting, really, really important, especially relating to change and being effective in organizations. You need to think about influence and persuasion. And then we're going to get into how do you make execution happen? You get paid to get results as a leader, so you got to execute. And then the last thing we're going to talk about is what we call top tier performance. You know, we need to know what the bar and the standard Standard looks like? What does good look like? What do great leaders do? It's, it's a science. It's not as much of an art form as you think. We know what organizations need to do to perform at the highest levels. And that informs us in terms of what leaders need to do to make that happen. So that's what we're going to talk about over the last quarter of the year. And hopefully we'll get a chance to see you there when we do. Um, with that, I am going to turn it back over to my esteemed colleague, Allison. Thank you so much, Ed. This was amazing. And I always learn so much from you and I'm so appreciative. So we are going to answer your questions in just one moment. As a reminder, if you have a question, the way to submit it is by clicking on the bottom bar of Zoom, clicking on Q&A and typing and submitting your questions there. But first, I have some questions for you. So I am launching a poll 
And the goal of this poll is that we are a very quickly growing organization. We are planning to launch a ton of new open enrollment, short courses, and certificate programs in the next coming years. And we want your input on what direction we should head in. So my first question for you is which of the following six week, $2.5,000, mostly asynchronous courses, would you be most likely to enroll in at Brown? And your choices, and you can check all that apply. Your choices are advanced diversity, equity, and inclusion, change management, conflict resolution, data analysis and visualization, emerging leaders, executive presence, financial management, leading an intergenerational workplace, managerial economics, strategic management, women's leadership, or none of the above. My second question for you, there are the next three questions are all about a marketing course. We're kind of looking at launching some marketing courses. Is so the second question is, which of the skill, following skills would you most want to learn in a marketing leadership course? The first is, the first choice is identifying and making changes based off of performance indicators, so analytics. The second one is data visualization. The third is AI and how it plays into marketing. The fourth is identifying your target customer and their needs and developing journey maps. The fourth is creating a business plan and identifying successful distribution channels. And the last is establishing a culture of innovation and managing a team for long-term success. And then also you can also say you're not interested in taking a marketing course. The third question is how likely would you be to enroll in a six week $2.5,000 asynchronous course on strategic marketing leadership for new ventures? So launching a new venture and those choices are extremely likely to extremely unlikely. And the last question is how likely are you to enroll in a six week $2.5,000 asynchronous course on data-driven marketing leadership looking at analytics with the choices being extremely likely to extremely unlikely. So I'll leave these questions open. Thank you all so much for answering them. For some people who are saying they don't see the polls, it should have popped up on your screen and then you scroll down to see all the answers, the questions. Um, so I hope, I hope it'll work for you. I hope you'll see it. But as I'll, I'll keep this open as we answer your questions. So the first question for you, Ed, is when problems arise during the change process, so it seems like the change isn't working, what are some tips that you have for communicating to the larger organization and keeping them focused and motivated? Yeah. So, I mean, I, it would be hard to highlight all of the different types of changes uh, that arise. So if you could put it into categories, you know, some of it has to do with the mechanical, I'll call it the operational or the mechanical side. You know, there might be a delay in putting a piece of uh, software in or, you know, it's a sophisticated piece of work. So that can take um, additional time. Some of it is it can take time to train people. Um, I think the key is to have clarity around, again, back to the plan, what you're trying to execute, and really attending to both sides of those plan, that plan at the same time. And as issues come up, diagnose them. We have a whole, um, we've already done a web webinar on problem solving. Really try to diagnose what's causing the barrier, the obstacle, the delay, and try to work if you have a team working on it, which you probably would if you're if you're doing a project and some type of change. Try to figure out what that the problem actually is before you solve it, and then use the process of project management to try to fix it. I think that's that's the key is to really try to understand you know problems are going to arise, you know what's causing them, you know don't shoot from the hip. Really do a proper diagnosis. And then, you know, tell the team what you found and then execute on the change. But I think that's an ongoing iterative process that you would need to, you would need to keep going through as a change manager. Thank you. That's really helpful. The next question is pretty related. It says, are there proven methodologies to get necessary change buy-in from leaderships when, from leadership when senior leaders are the ones who are resistant to and afraid? Oh, well, that's change? that's a trickier question. We'll have to look at influence and persuasion next time. Um, you know, you you want to work hard to try to enlist uh, support. You know, so if you're rolling out some type of change, you know, you typically need a sponsor. You need someone who's senior enough in the organization to be able to you know, be the champion of that change to help influence their colleagues. Um, also to make sure that the resources are available, that people carve out the time they need to do that. 
if you don't have that, it's going to be tough to make your change work. If you don't have sponsorship at the right level, if you don't have effective communication, real enlistment of people who it's going to impact, um, I would be really cautious about engaging in something without the kind of support that you need. Thank you. Next question is, how do you create alignment when different teams have different and competing priorities, but you have to work together on the change? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, most teams and most individuals have different priorities. What you find is you you try to have, and you know you, you have to establish trust. Uh, you have to try to get those priorities out on the table. And then you have to have a process whereby you look through the different priorities and try to manage to, you know, the, the, I would say not the lowest common denominator, but the highest level of, of agreement you can get across all the different teams. So you need to you need to figure out what the priorities are. You need to make them plain. You need to sort of prioritize, not being funny, you need to actually prioritize them and then compare them to the other parts of the organization to figure out, okay, are there any that are complementary or there's some that are competitive and try to moderate those in some way, shape or form. But usually transparency, again, it always depends on the nature of the organization and what people are willing to share, but transparency is usually your friend in that environment. Thank you. Next question is, how do middle managers help manage or influence change when they don't have a lot of formal authority? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I would argue that more often than not, middle managers don't have that much formal authority mm -hmm. anymore. So really, you're looking at influence and persuasion uh, across organizations. You know, the era of Allison works for me, I just go tell her what to do and she does it. Uh, th those days, I won't say are gone, but they're not really the kind of feature of the workplace that we see. Certainly, there are hierarchies, but people work in so many different projects on so many different teams. More often than not, people are getting things done through the nature of the relationships they have, you know, that they've built trust with people, that they've made an effort to help them with their work. And then there's an element of reciprocation, one of the influence principles. But really, influence and persuasion is how organizations and people at all levels of organizations get things done today. It's, it's not as much as for, for, about formal authority as we, we might think. Thank you. It's really helpful. Next question was specifically asking about DEI and kind of the changing context, but I think I'm going to slightly tweak it just a little bit because sure. I think that since we're talking about change management and less about, you know, a specific topic, I think what makes the most sense is to ask you, how do you manage, get buy-in for, and reduce barriers to change that may be controversial and that controversy could be at the organizational level or in this case at like the political societal level? Well, I think I, I probably wouldn't be in a position to talk about the uh, societal level of change. You know, certainly organizations exist in industries and in industries and in societies <clears throat> in nations, however you want to define it. And to lesser or greater degrees, they're impacted by the things and the changes that are happening in the broader society. Like DEI and i is a good example. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to be mindful of, you know, there's certainly laws and regulations and things we have to do. And then there's things we ought to do. Um, bringing those into the organization very thoughtfully, probably a lot of education up front, um, testing the waters, doing things in an experimental or one part of the organization uh, before you roll it out to everybody, just being really mindful. Um, I think one of the challenges of many that we face is just because someone thinks something is a good idea and it could truly be a good idea, be a good idea doesn't mean the organization is immediately going to go along with it. There's a lot of education. DI is a good example. There's a lot of education. There's a lot of training. There's a lot of policy making. There's a lot of work that it goes into making any type of change stick in an organization. So I wouldn't say I, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say that there's a totally different approach to something that's sort of driven by an ex externality. I would say though that good change management practice is like why are we doing this? What are we going to get out of it? All those basic kind of elements still should exist for that as well. Because again, our job is to guide that change through regardless of what it is. We just have to be mindful of the sensitivities and the capacity to change the organization has. Thank you. I love that. I love the idea of piloting it. I think that's really Yeah, powerful. I think that's, you know, the, that used to be called the big bang versus the pilot. And when we've had technology, you know, do it all at once. And, and if you can, usually if you can pilot something, you learn a lot um, and then you can incorporate it into a broader effort. Absolutely. 
Um, this is unfortunately the last question we have time for, which Oh, is, too bad. I know the time really flew and you all asked incredible questions. Thank you so much. Um, and this question is also incredible, which is how do you prioritize multi-channel organizational change management that's going to all utilize the same team and resources? Well, I'm not exactly sure. Sh I'm not sure I know exactly what that question is all about, but it sounds like you're using one team to manage change across multiple channels. Uh, I would say that goes back to having a very clear prioritization and plan about who's going to be impacted when and why, right? I, you know, if it really gets back into the rollout plan. But you can also co opt different parts of the organization, um, you know, different channels, if you will. Earlier on, you can, you can pull people out of those channels, train a cadre, and then send them back. And then they would help sort of lay the groundwork for some type of deployment. But I think a lot of that has to do on the specific organization, the nature of change. Those are just sort of conceptually different ways to think about it. But um, a lot of it has to do with really thinking about how you want this change to happen. You know, in which parts of the organization, at what time, you know, and, and all of those things being factored into your overall plan. Thank you so much. Sure. That was a great answer. And thank you all so much for great coming team, here everybody. today, for asking incredible questions. And I hope that we get to see you in our virtual or in-person classrooms again very soon. We will be sending out a recording of the session and the slides shortly. So keep an eye out on your inbox for more information about our future sessions and for the material from this one. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day. Bye, -bye. Bye everyone.